to hear from you. Um, we want your spirit to be among us, Father. Pray that you just get rid of uh, all the distractions uh, that are going through our minds right now, uh, all the things of this world that uh, just cause us to neglect the commandments that you have for us. So again, this morning we just pray that you would meet us here and that we would be soft and pliable in your hands and that you could shape us more into your image. In Jesus' name, amen. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare your living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted it. Sweetest of loves When my heart becomes weak And my strength is undone Your presence, Lord Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit you are welcome here
Father, we are so glad that it's not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. We don't have to do anything out of our own ability. We can just come to you and receive that same power that Jesus had, that same power that healed the sick, the same power that gave sight to the blind, the same power that endured the cross for our sin. It would have been too easy for him to come off that cross. But instead, he used the power of the Holy Spirit and endured that for you and for me. Father, we are so grateful this morning just for the love you have for us. And we pray that we would in turn express that love to others, that we would express that love to you by our devotion to you, by our willingness to obey your commandments that are found in your word. So Father, this morning we pray that as we open your word, you would just give us a deeper understanding and give us a desire and a passion uh, to obey your word and to hide it in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, good morning, everybody. Is it? We're good. There we are. All right. Uh, Pastor Scott is not here this morning, wasn't feeling too well, so I'm filling in for him so we can keep him in our prayers, and he's feeling better soon here. I'll open your Bibles, if you would, please, to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to actually be in two places today, Hebrews 11 and the book of Jude, which is right before the book of Revelation. Let's jump right in here because we're going to try and do a little bit of a compare and contrast study today and see what we can learn, but we'll be covering a, a bit of ground, and Sunday school is not our longest teaching time, so... Chapter one, uh, verse 1 in chapter 11 of Hebrews says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, for the evidence of things not seen. For, it, for by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. So he's laying a quick foundation here. He's going to talk about faith. And the idea of faith is one that is um, something everybody, I think, intrinsically understands. Believers, unbelievers, doesn't matter what your background is, everyone understands faith because we all in our lives utilize a certain amount of faith. We have faith in people, we have faith in institutions, we have faith in laws of nature, right? We, we do a lot of things because even though we can't see it, and even though we may not always have proof of it, we act on good faith. We have that, that's the phrase, act in good faith with somebody. But the thing with faith is, faith is often hard to justify purely with intellectual argument, right? Because that's what he's saying here, like even, and, and it's Rather fitting, tonight we're going to start in the book of Genesis and work through the book of Genesis on Sunday nights now. What does he say? We understand the worlds were framed by the word of God. He's going back to creation. Say, how do we understand that? Well, by faith. We have faith that God said it, therefore he's done it. Now, that doesn't mean that there would be no proof of the fact that how it works and and, and we can't use science to understand some things about God and to understand the means and methods which God uses, but it starts with a position of faith. I once saw an interview with um, Dawkins, a famous atheist, and the guy actually had backed him into the corner to, to admit that, okay, it's possible that intelligent design could be true. And then the guy asked him, so God could have created? He says, no, that's not possible. He goes, well, you just said intelligent design is possible. He goes, well, yes, intelligent design, but not God. 
Why? Because, well, he's starting from a place of faith, even though we, we would say unbelief in one sense, but it's really faith. He has rock-solid faith that God doesn't exist so much that he won't even consider any possibility in which God exists. Now, if we have faith that God is, then that shapes a whole lot of things for us. And so that's where he's starting off telling us, he's going to go through, like some call this the, the Hall of Faith, right? The chapter of the Hall of Faith, famous people of faith. And we're going to do a little compare and contrast here. So let's go through the next, uh, up to verse 12, or we're going to go up to 16. I'm just going to read it to start with. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which we obtain witnesses that he was righteous, witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead, still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death, and it was not found, and he was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had a testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Right? That's what we just said. You can't come to God without believing God is. Just common sense. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of the things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was recalled to go to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has a foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past age because she was judged because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky a multitude, innumerable as the sands which are by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. For they who say such things declare plainly they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. All right. So we're, we'll go into some of these examples here in a minute. But before we do that, um, I want to just... Come to this point that he wraps it up, that, that idea here with. He starts talking about our citizenship. And, he's, and this is just invariably tied into faith. If we have faith that God is, and we have faith in all that God has said, then one thing we understand is what's going to happen to the things of this world. Do they last? No. What is the whole point of him sending his son to die for us? It's for us to obtain the inheritance with Christ, to enter into that relationship, to gain that eternal home. And so we have a choice, he says. Listen, these saints of old, whether it be Abel, Enoch, Abraham, Sarah, Noah, right? All these saints of old, even back then, without having the New Testament to go off, understood something. They understood that they were seeking something better than this world had to offer. And just like every one of us, we have opportunity to turn back. We could turn back. We could seek after the things of this world, just like they could, but they didn't. They, it says here that they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. You see, that word desire is important because desire has everything to do with the heart and almost nothing to do with the mind. This is why even the demons knew who Jesus was. Even the demons believed who Jesus was. It wasn't a matter of faith. This is why salvation is not a matter of head knowledge. It's a matter of heart. And do we desire God? See, this is where that whole love resides. 
Do we love God? Do we love our neighbor? And if those things are there in us, then we desire something greater than what the world has to offer. And we see this example in guys like Abel. We see this example in someone like Enoch. Enoch is such an interesting guy because the Bible says so little about him, and yet he was very plainly one of the most godly men of his day. And we're going to go over to Jude now, and Jude is the other place we learn a little bit about Enoch. But we're going to see the opposite here. You see, Jude had to write because of false teachers that were coming in. And not just false teachers. These weren't people who were saved but had some wrong doctrine. See, we run into people like that in the Bible. One very well-known one was Apollos. Right? Apollos had shown up in Corinth, I believe, yeah, in Corinth, and he, all he, had, he hadn't even heard of Jesus yet. What he heard about was the baptism of John, and he believed in God, and he was teaching the best he knew how. So he was teaching a doctrine that wasn't complete, and what happened to Quilla and Priscilla, pull him aside and say, Apollos, we need to fill you in on the rest of the story here. And Apollos is like, wow, this is the best thing ever, and he goes off teaching Jesus now. And preaching the gospel. So, see, that's a guy who, yeah, didn't have all the knowledge. His heart was in the right place. Just needed a little bit of updating and correction on that. And boom, he was ready to go. See, these are not that. These are heretics. These are apostates. I mean, these are all words we used to use in in the old days in the church. But what that just really means is these are guys who aren't saved. These are guys who have snuck in with the purpose of deception these are false shepherds, wicked rulers, uh, like Ezekiel would talk about, the wicked shepherds. And so he says in verse 5 of the book of Jude, But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. The angels, who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, He has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Talking about those that fell with Satan. As Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities around them in similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, Also these dreamers defile the flesh. They reject authority and speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael the archangel in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses dared not bring a reviling accusation but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know and whatever they know naturally like brute beasts. In these things they corrupt themselves. Woe to them for they have gone in the way of Cain They have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are spots in your love feast while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are without cloud, they are clouds without water carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up with their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. The theme of that prophecy being the ungodly, right? (laughs) You get that word ungodly a lot in a few words, in a few sentences. So what are we talking about here? What we get here in Jude is a comparison list. It's a slightly different angle than it's taken in Hebrews for this is how you should walk, right? We get the hall of faith, those that are set apart for us as follow this example of faith. And in Jude, we get this comparison of these false teachers. They are just like these people in the Bible, which is exactly a list of this is what you don't do. And who's on this list? We have Cain. Oh, it's interesting because Abel was on the list of faith. So let's take a minute and do a little compare and contrast. What we're told in Hebrews is that Abel gave a sacrifice that pleased God. Cain did not. 
What was it about the sacrifice? We don't know. Plenty of people have speculated. You have speculation that it uh, might have something to do with the animals versus the first fruits. Arguments for and against that can be made. There's some speculation that you could possibly have seen it that will remember what Jesus says. When he says, if you bring your gift to the altar and you remember your brother has something against you, do what? Leave it. I don't want your sacrifice as long as you have this broken relationship. Well, you know, for Cain to get to murdering Abel, my guess is the sacrifice thing probably wasn't their first problem, right? There was probably a lot of anger and hatred, so that's another possibility that Cain brought an impure heart and the hatred towards his brother was part of why it wasn't accepted. There's lots of possibilities out there. But either way, what we know is Cain was a man who was prone to anger, and he let that anger get the better of him. And, he, and, and that cannot please God. So they've gone in the way of Cain, it says. So if nothing else, what can we say about Cain? Well, Cain was a murderer, and Cain also was one who was jealous of his brother being accepted by God. One of the early marks of these false teachers that we saw was they would often take guys like Paul and Peter and Paul, and they would try and tear them down. Paul had to deal with that a lot in his letters. Why are you listening to these false teachers who are telling you things about me? You know me. I've been there. Why do you honor what they say, right? And so we have to be careful in our own lives as we look at that as an example to be sure that we do not allow that kind of jealousy to enter in to our lives. When God is doing a work in one person's life, it does not mean that it is because God doesn't love us or God likes them better. In fact, this is what God had to tell Cain back in Genesis, right? He says, Cain, why are you upset? If you do well, won't you be accepted? That's his whole point. He says, Cain, don't think this is some favoritism of Abel. Don't think this is anything special for Abel. You could get the same exact thing if you want. You could have me accept you. So when we start looking at people, around and it's easy especially when we have that little twinge of guilt we haven't been following the lord like we should and we see the lord bringing people up giving them calling in their life giving them ministry to do in their life and people in the church look at it and they're like wow it's amazing to see what god's doing that jealousy can just brew in us but understand that's not exclusive to anybody god is willing to work with any heart that's willing they talk about Enoch here. Let's move on to Enoch for a second. Enoch, we see a man, and again, we know very little about his life other than he was godly. He was godly to the point that this is the first we know it happened in the Bible, first we're told, that he doesn't die. That he's been on this earth, uh, I can't remember the exact age, eight, nine hundred years or whatever it was. He's been around a long time like everybody else had been. Um, that lived natural lives back then, and all of a sudden he's gone. Where'd he go? Well, the Lord took him straight up to heaven. And if you think about the implication of that, how important that would have been and what that actually signified back then was, well, death was the curse. This would have been certainly a sign to people, I approve of this life. And that's what Hebrews actually tells us. Because of the approval and favor that he found in God's sight, because of the godly way he lived, he was spared the, the, the process of death and just brought right up to dwell with God. And here is a man who had that kind of godliness and his prophecy that he gives is what? Listen, the Lord is coming with 10,000, not 10,000, it's a big multiple of the ten thousands, ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. So these are ungodly sinners and ungodly people doing ungodly deeds in ungodly ways. And their speech, notice this, 
who is their speech against? It doesn't say here in this prophecy the saints. That's him with a capital H. They are the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against God. Listen to this very day the accusations brought against God. People, all sorts, right? You don't have to go far to find them, especially with an internet, right? We, people bring accusations against God the whole time. And the question is, how do we answer that? How would we answer those accusations brought against God? Because, you know what, there is a deceiver out there, and there is a deceiver who has planted many, many lies in the hearts of men. Those that would walk around saying, oh, look at the God of the Old Testament, killing women and children, destroying, genocidal maniac that God was. I've heard that one. Others have heard that one, right? right? Oh, God plays favorites. Choosing Israel. What makes Israel so special? Right? Which, of course, as I like to remind people that one, you'd say that about anyone chosen. You can't choose anybody if that's your argument. Right? There can be no such thing. But they don't like the favoritism God plays. They, don't like the, they blame God for the evil in this world that's committed. Right? So how do we answer these things? How do we answer somebody who is bringing this kind of accusation against God? Well, this is why I I firmly believe when you look at most of the teaching that Paul would do and and even Jesus would do, but almost all the New Testament stuff that we find in here, they only point to one thing as proof of God's love. And that's what you can't see behind here, (laughs) the cross. The cross is proof. Paul would say that in Romans chapter 5, that well, we were still sinners. Think about the hope of those words right there. While we were still sinners. We've declared war on God. We've rebelled against God. And not only have we rebelled against God, we have destroyed and harmed and hated his creation and fellow men. We're told in Revelation we're going to people will be held accountable for wantonly destroying the earth. Right? These are all acts of rebellion, and yet while we did all of these things that have been deserving of death, God still loved us. Do we have faith in that? Do we have that kind of faith? And then we have, you know, they go through the list of Balaam and Korah, Sodom and Gomorrah. And I mean, we could go through all the things that are are wrong in those And we don't have time, unfortunately, right now to get through them all. But we know Balaam, it was about money. He was willing to teach someone how to destroy God's people to get rich. And what did he find for it? Destruction. Because he loved money more than he loved God. And we see in Korah. Korah, right, he was an Israelite. He was... was, um, part of the ministry in the temple who couldn't stand it that Moses got all the credit, that Moses got to be in charge. Again, that jealousy rearing its ugly head, and it wasn't enough, so now he had to ferment rebellion in the camp to sow strife among God's people. That's a big one in churches, isn't it? Because Do we think all these churches all over the place that get these splits and these breakups that happen do it just because? There's always strife at the center of it. Sometimes, yes, I'm not saying all of them are wrong things, right? There are times that sometimes leaders of churches and denominations just go into ungodliness and true false doctrine, which through all efforts made to reconcile, cannot be reconciled, then you just have to, to get out of it. That, that's legitimate. It happens. But how many people leave churches over strife in the end? Right? Because the, the true spirit of God within us promotes unity. Right? I mean, let, let's do a show of hands really quick. How many of you honestly expect to agree with everyone in here on everything? 
I mean, really, we, we don't, right? So what is this unity that the Spirit of God gives us? It is not agreement on nuance of every issue that we could face as a church. That's not what it is, right? We would all handle things slightly differently, right? If, if, if we had five people lined up to teach senior high Sunday school, each a person gained two months. I guess what? Each two months would probably look a little different. Doesn't make one right, doesn't make one wrong. It's just we would do things differently. So what does the unity of the Spirit do? Well, the unity of the Spirit basically helps us to say, guess what? It's not about me. <laughs> it's not about me. It's not about me getting exactly what I want. It's not about me... Um, I want to be careful how I say this. There are things in our life that are important for good reason, okay? And it doesn't necessarily mean we cave on everything, right? It, 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 that's, I don't think that's what the Bible necessarily teaches. There were times when Paul and Barnabas, though as tragic as it was, just had to say, you know what? I think right now it's just best. You go here and do this ministry. I'll go here and do this ministry. But we find later it never broke their fellowship, Right? But when we start talking about this kind of strife, what the Holy Spirit wants to do is keep the unity amongst us in that there is a bond of love that can never be broken. That when, even if it is a separating physically, even if it is a separating in ministry and work for a period of time, there is no point in which you would look back at that person and say, I can't believe that person did that, or that we would look back with resentment, or, or hatred even, or bitterness. See, that's what there's no room for. And so the unity of the Spirit doesn't allow for that. You see, a great example that I see of that in the Bible comes back to one of the guys in the chapter of faith. We see it with Abraham and Lot. So remember the division that happened between, between Abraham and Lot. Lord says to Abraham, Abraham, get out, go to your place. And after all these ways and wanderings, Lot has come with him. And Lot and Abraham have been both blessed by God. And they have a whole lot of herds. And the shepherds and the herders start fighting amongst each other. They start, they start battling it out to the point where Abraham and Lot are like, this is not going to work. This isn't Okay this kind of division that we have right now. So what do we do about it? And what was Abraham do? Abraham says, listen, we're family. The Lord has blessed us. Just look at the whole land before you. You can go to the right. You can go to the left. You go one way. I'll just go whichever way you don't pick. How could Abraham do that? I mean, Abraham was the head of the family. Abraham was the chosen one. Abraham was the one really, I, I, I mean, maybe Lot would have been still blessed, but there's very little doubt that Abraham, the blessing God put on Abraham was passed over to his whole household. And Lot enjoyed that greatly. But Lot, Abraham lowers himself and humbles himself and says to Lot, you choose. And he, this is a perfect picture of what we see. The, the compare and contrast here between Hebrews 11, of 11, those who lived by faith versus those that sought an earthly kingdom and in the end find only destruction. Because Abraham's actions were motivated by, the, motivated by the faith that God would provide for him. The blessing of God would always come true. There is no decision that Abraham could make about where he lived that would change that fact. That's the kind of rock-solid faith that Abraham had. And Lot, looking was a little far too happy to be like, well, all right, if you're going to let me choose. And he looks this way, and he looks that way, and he looks this way, and he looks that way. And like, and let's not be too hard on Many of us would do the same thing. Do you think he took the better or the worse? He took the better. He took the better. But the problem is, he took the path towards Sodom. And it, a lot though we find out, right? Lot was righteous. Lot doesn't get lumped in with guys like Cain. He doesn't get lumped in with guys like Esau or Balaam or any of these wicked people. He was a righteous man. 
And yet in the end, what did, was he left with? What did he have to show for it all? He had absolutely nothing to show for it. Because every blessing that he brought into the, the quest for worldly pleasure and worldly enjoyment was destroyed. See, in the end, that's what this really comes down to. That's what I'm hoping to bring across with this. You see, that's why the writer of Hebrews would bring this whole part of faith back to what country are you seeking? And in the book of Jude, it comes down to what are they seeking? These false teachers, these men that were comparing and putting in the same camp with Balaam and Cain and Korah. They are seeking earthly things. They are seeking earthly position, earthly wealth, earthly power. That's what they want. Each of us is faced with these choices every day. Are we going to walk by faith, seeking that which is better, doing that which is hard to do? It runs against our nature, right? Because this is exactly what he says in the book of Jude, where he says, um, Woe to them, sorry, uh, they speak evil of whatever they do not know. So anything, the idea is in the spiritual sense. They don't know it. And they speak evil of it. But whatever they know naturally, all the stuff we know naturally, we know about money, we know about pleasure, we know about all the things this world has to offer, it says they, in these things they corrupt themselves. So to walk by faith takes tremendous amounts of trust tremendous amounts of faith because of what it means is laying down everything that we are so naturally drawn to. It's one of the things we're going to talk a little bit about tonight, and I'll just touch on it a little bit now, is even in a marriage relationship, right? Marriage relationships are designed to be a husband looks after the best for a wife and a wife looks after the best for the husband, Think about the faith that that requires. Because I, I'll tell you just through the, the marriage counseling that I've done, there is no marriage that has gone a little off the tracks that doesn't have the situation where they've gotten to the point where it's now sides. You against me. Me against you. And all of a sudden, I'm not looking out for my wife. I'm looking out for myself. But you know how hard it is. We, you guys do, right? Those of you who have been married, successfully married, or even just had good portions of your marriage, you understand how hard it is to set aside your own rights, to set aside, I don't deserve this, I, it, you need to do better for me, and say, you know what? My spouse needs something right now, so I'm going to lay that aside, and we're going to work on this and figure out what we really need here. That's hard to do, isn't it? It's hard to do in business relationships. It's hard to do in friendships. But would we live like Abraham? Because Abraham, I mean, think about it. He offered his nephew the best. Because what we're told in Hebrews, the motive of Abraham's heart is he sought a land a homeland that wasn't here on this earth, and he knew it. So why would we ever allow anything on this earth to get in the way of that quest? And the beauty of it all is, this is the faith part of it. Do we ever have to doubt we'll gain it in the end? No, this isn't a what if. This isn't some wild treasure hunt that maybe the map's true, maybe it's not, and if I read it just right and get to the places quick enough, I'll gain the reward just maybe. No, this is we are guaranteed the results. We just have to hold on. We have to walk by faith, and we have to seek the things 
that go beyond this world. So Lord, help us to do that. When the temptations come to worldliness, Lord, when the temptation comes to seek after wealth, to seek after pleasure, Lord, even just to seek after temporary peace and quiet at the expense of others, Lord, to seek after any of these things at the expense of our heavenly home, at the expense of those you ask us to love. Lord, help us to stand in faith. Help us by your Holy Spirit to be encouraged to do what's right, knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have a reward and a home for us that will surpass anything we can imagine. Lord, uh, a reward that is not even with which the sufferings of this world are not even worthy to be mentioned. So we thank you, we praise you, and we do again want to lift up Pastor Scott to you and ask that you help him to feel better. In Jesus' name, amen.